In this collection of videos, we're going to dive more into voting theory and really discover some interesting and complicated things that can happen with some of the voting systems we've already covered. So far, we've discussed a couple of fairness conditions on our voting systems. In particular, we had a more in-depth discussion of the concepts of anonymity and neutrality, and those are some real basic concepts of fairness that we want to impose on our voting systems. But in these videos, I'd like to study some more complex ideas of fairness that sometimes come up when you're studying social choice theory. Now, the first two I'm going to introduce here are not particularly complicated. We just haven't formally stated them as fairness conditions we may wish to preserve. The first is the majority condition. So what we have discussed is the difference between a majority and a plurality. And many of our voting systems were specifically designed to try to force a candidate to hold a majority of votes before being declared a victor. So formally, if we want a voting system to satisfy the majority condition, what this means is that if there is a candidate that actually does have majority support, we want that candidate to be the winner of the election. So that's one of our new fairness conditions that we'll be thinking about here. The next condition we have is a really similar idea. The big idea behind both the majority condition and the Condorcet condition is that if there's some type of strong candidate measurable in various ways, either by the majority condition or by the Condorcet condition. So recall that a Condorcet victor of an election system is one who would win in any possible head-to-head -head matchup. So that's another way of measuring a strong candidate, is it somebody who would beat anybody else that they faced if it were just a one-on-one -on -one election. So a voting system that satisfies the Condorcet condition is one that would elect a Condorcet candidate should such a candidate exist. Those types of candidates, majority candidates and Condorcet candidates, don't always exist. But we would like it that if they do, both of those are measures of very strong candidates, and so we would often like our voting systems to elect them should those candidates be present in the race. Now the next one I want to introduce is a little bit more complicated, so I'd like to introduce it with an example. And I'm a big fan of doing voting with candy, and so we're going to be talking about having candy dates in our election. So what I'd like for us to imagine is that we have four candidates that we were already considering. In this image, our four candidates are Hershey's, Reese's, York, and Dots. And let's imagine that we've already worked hard to come up with a collective ranking of those four candidates, and I've displayed that here. As a group, we prefer Hershey's to Reese's, Reese's to York, and York to Dots. Now what we want to think about is we've already collectively made that group decision, and we're going to have some sort of new candy that we introduce, and we'd like to figure out where that candy falls in the grand scheme of things. Now I want to envision this example with various other candies in place, and perhaps to make a point, I'd like to use a really dramatic candidate, and imagine that we introduced spinach as though it were candy. When we think about where spinach should rank in the grand scheme of things, most of us really think that spinach should fall here, dead last. Spinach, what are you doing here? You're not even candy, get out, right? However, theoretically, if we introduced a real candy into this situation that people might actually have preferences for over the other candies, we could envision that candy going a lot of different places. Maybe it isn't our favorite candy and it goes to the end. Maybe it is our favorite candy and it skyrockets all the way to the front. It's a great new option. But we could also envision the new candy sneaking into any one of these holes that are drawn here on the screen. And this would seem like a relatively fair or plausible ranking with the introduction of the new candy. It would seem weird, however, if we were to introduce something as dramatic as spinach. And even if we take the spinach and put it properly in its place, as the absolute worst in our ranking, it would seem really weird if somehow proposing the idea of spinach made dots seem so desirable that they skyrocket from worst to first place. 
that generally doesn't sit well with people, that the idea that this totally unfavorable candidate could be introduced and it could dramatically change the results of the previous election, that idea normally troubles people. Something that troubles people a little bit less but can still trouble people is the idea that you introduce this new candy and it slips into one of the cracks. We have something like Rolo and maybe we decide that we like it a little bit better than York but not as much as Reese's or Hershey's and we slip it in right here but it still may be weird for dots to move places. Maybe dots doesn't go from worst to first like it did in the most dramatic example, but it might seem weird to us that we could prefer the Rolo to the York and prefer the York to the dots, but then ultimately prefer the dots to the Rolo. That would break what we call mathematically as transitivity, that we like a more than B and B more than C, we'd like to deduce that we like A more than C. So something like this, if it were allowable, would violate that property of transitivity. Or more generally speaking, what we're trying to encapsulate here is this idea of the independence of an irrelevant alternative. So in particular, when I was choosing spinach, I was trying to focus on that idea of irrelevant. When we have something that is truly irrelevant, it shouldn't change our choices dramatically. That's the idea behind this type of concept. So we'll say that a voting method satisfies the independence of irrelevant alternatives, sometimes referred to more briefly as the IIA. If a group choice that already favors candidate A over candidate B is not affected by candidate C entering or leaving the race. So that's the concept of maybe candidate C comes in and it's the best. We prefer candidate C to A and B. That's fine. Maybe candidate C comes in and it's the worst and we want to put C right at the end, A, B, C. Or maybe C is in between and we still like A the most, candidate C goes in the middle and candidate B is last. But the idea is we really shouldn't introduce candidate C, which is totally irrelevant to the way we feel about the relationship between A and B, and candidate C existing shouldn't change the way we feel about the relationship between A and B. So that's the idea behind the IIA, a little more complicated than some of the things we've seen before. Now what I want to make clear is that although the idea of transitivity with preferences and the IIA sounds reasonable and satisfiable for an individual within a system. Most individual people do follow the IIA and these ideas of transitivity of preference. However, when you start talking about a collective choice, some sort of group choice system, social choice function that takes into account many people's preferences all at once, it gets a lot harder to satisfy this type of property. So in reality, this condition of the IIA is a very strong condition. It's really hardly ever satisfied by a voting method, and it is somewhat controversial when you're looking into social choice theory. So just as an example of this, here's a voter profile that does not satisfy the IIA. Candidates A and B here have a very close race going in terms of their preference. And candidate C is kind of the worst, kind of like spinach in the previous example, doesn't have a huge number of people supporting that candidate C. However, when we take a look, just as an example, let's use the plurality voting system here, since it's fairly fast and easy to compute. If we were to conduct a plurality vote, given the state of affairs shown in this voter profile, candidate A would be ranked over candidate B, all over candidate C. But if candidate C were to drop out of the race, you're the worst candidate C, go home. Those three voters who preferred candidate C first actually prefer candidate B second, and that increases candidate B's count to 51 voters. And if we were then to do a plurality vote, candidate B would win. So with the existence of candidate C 
our group prefers A over B, but without the existence of candidate C, our group prefers candidate B to A. So this is a hard condition to satisfy when we're taking into account group preferences, even though it sounds reasonable on an individual level.